this morning, we've got a cracking panel. Uh, let me introduce them for you. Uh, first is Professor Rowania Higgins, who was appointed Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Maori to Ahurei, which I understand, if I'm getting the, uh, the correlation correct, is managing chaos that's swirling around you for that term. So uh, I feel as though that might be the story of my life some of the time. But uh, appointed Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Wellington's Victoria University in 2016, who's been leading the charge in New Zealand around language and how to maintain that and, and what that means. Ladies and gentlemen, please make the professor welcome. Anya Lane Lomas is a proud Wiradjuri woman originally from southwest New South Wales who grew up listening to the stories and her language from her elders at a time in Australia when, well, they were punished for doing just that. Uh, her nephew, a mentor and very good friend of mine, Stan, has been mentioned before and has written and spoken about this a lot, as uh, has Anya uh, Elaine's entire family. Ladies and gentlemen, please make her welcome. And since 1972, Michael Walsh has conducted field work of Indigenous language and cultures across the top end, but focusing particularly uh, in on the Darwin Daly region, just to the south and to the slightly uh, to the west of Darwin, where uh, there is still incredible connection to culture, like there is across very many parts of the Northern Territory. Uh, he, this has uh, compromised a mixture of academic endeavours as well of, as consultancies since back in 19. 79, a time when Australia wasn't even prepared to have these conversations. Uh, what a difference those decades have made in the work of you and others. Please make him welcome. And last but not least, uh, our esteemed chair for this discussion this morning. Uh, you've heard her mention this morning, Professor Jacqueline uh, Troy is, is a Narugu woman from the snowy mountains of New South Wales, is the Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research at the University of Sydney. And her research and academic interests focus on language, particularly contact languages and how we protect and preserve those uh, that, as we heard earlier, are often dubbed uh, languages that are dead. What happens when we get to that point? Ladies and gentlemen, our chair this morning, Professor Jacqueline Troy. Thank you so much. Um, John, you remember? It's great. We're all speaking Ngunnawal. Fabulous. So, um, great way to start this day. Um, yeah, there's clearly no dead languages in this room, which is good to hear. And I think um, that's one of the things that Michael, in talking to you about what you would like to focus on today, you were maybe, if you don't mind, we might start with Michael giving us um, a few of the reasons why we shouldn't be using language like that and why all sorts of databases out there online like Ethnologue and Glottologue and all the authorities um, that say that our language is a dead, mine's dead, I don't feel so dead and um, <laughs> I may not be a fluent speaker of Narugu but I am Yamachi and I will speak my language again. I'm inspired by my brother here who I've known since we were almost small children together in Atsik. So um, I think that there's a great future for all the indigenous languages of the world because people like everybody in this room care and that's all it takes really and um, let's all be multilingual. So Michael, you want to tell us why there's no such thing as extinct languages in Australia? <laughs> I'll try. I'll just chuck that to you now. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, Jackie mentioned ethnologue. Uh, this is a sort of catalogue of the world's uh, roughly 7,000 languages, and so each language gets a profile. Uh, for Ngunnawal, uh, it uh, declares that it's extinct. Now. Uh, we've just heard from Jai and Tyrone, they don't look extinct to me. Um, <laughs> and I might say just a bit about the Ngunnawal uh, issue. Jackie, um, if you like, founded or in invited Ngunnawal people to IATSIS uh, in September 2013 uh, to talk about the possibility of language revitalisation, not to say we have to do it, but we're the mechanics, we can assist and we've got a, uh, a, a major resource in IATSIS to assist with these things. Um, two and a half years later from that standing start, uh, as we've heard, Malcolm Turnbull gave the first speech for a Prime Minister in an Aboriginal language. 
in the clip that um, Tyrone was showing, just over his left shoulder was an Aboriginal man, Ken Wyatt, whose view on that um, is interesting because he's not from, he's from Western Australia, I believe, but uh, as an Aboriginal man, his reaction was that Malcolm Turns Turnbull's gesture of addressing Parliament in the Ngunnawal language uh, signifies a different approach to Indigenous affairs that puts the speech on par with Paul Keating's Redfern speech and Kevin Rudd's apology uh, to the stolen generations. So this is an Aboriginal man and that's the impact it has on him. If you were looking closely, you'd see that Malcolm Turnbull was reading from, from some notes. He'd been given a, an excellent tutorial uh, on the Ngunnawal language and soaked it up pretty fast. Uh, but uh, Australia Day 2017, um, he gave the same speech again, an acknowledgement to country on the uh, banks of Lake Burley Griffin here in Canberra and there were no notes that I could see. He just absorbed it and spoke it um, by heart, if not from the heart. And he kept on giving the same speech a number of times since. So getting back to this question of extinction, uh, I've been asked to do the Australian revision of the Routledge Encyclopedia of Endangered Languages. And the general editor for this asked me to list the Australian languages that are extinct. <laughs> um, I pointed out I've got a problem with this, mate. Uh, Aboriginal people object to the term extinct, and so do I. Uh, so I went back to the ethnologue uh, definition of what's extinct. There are two criteria. The first is there's no one that speaks this language anymore. And sadly, it's true that there are some Australian languages that fit that criterion. But the second criterion is roughly uh, there's no one who gains their identity from that language. And at that point, I argued with the general editor, I think there are no Australian languages that are extinct because even if no one speaks them, uh, there are certainly going to be people who gain their identity from it. Uh, another supposedly extinct language is uh, Dungati from the north coast of New South Wales. Um, it says it's extinct and uh, a distinguished academic from ANU, Stephen Worm, said in 2007 that it had been extinct for two decades at that point. Not so long ago, uh, Craig Ritchie, who's the CEO of IATSIS, uh, was in, uh, Lund uh, sorry, in um, uh, New York uh, addressing the General Assembly Chamber uh, as part of the launch uh, from the UN of the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Craig Ritchie gave a speech in Dungati, a supposedly extinct language. He also did the same thing at the Paris um, launch uh, through UNESCO of the International Year of Indigenous Languages. Another good news story uh, relates to uh, the um, uh, language we heard about yesterday uh, from, br uh, from um, uh, sorry, I'm just losing my place here, uh, okay. from Noongar. Uh, so Professor Kim Scott mentioned Clint Bracknell a number of times um, and Clint's uh, wife now, uh, Kylie Farmer, is part of a, um, is a, a professional actor. One of the things she uh, did in 20, uh, 2017, it must be, was appear on Q&A on the ABC delivering some um, Shakespearean sonnets that have been translated into Noongar. Now, when I mention this to some people, they're amazed that a supposedly extinct language uh, could be sufficient to capture uh, the um, words of the bard. But... Um, I was congratulating Kylie about two years ago um, when we were bound for Honolulu for an international conference and sort of said, way to go, mate. Uh, you did a great job on uh, Q&A. And she sort of sighed and said, yeah, but now the next task is to translate Macbeth. 
<laughs> Not long after, um, they had a child, a young son, and I figured, right, well, Macbeth has gone out the window, uh, except Clint uh, gave me an update saying she's over in Perth doing rehearsals for Macbeth. <laughs> So those are some of the instances of languages that are supposedly down the drain that are now coming back to life, if you like. Another last one that I mentioned is Yawaru from the Broome area. Um, a colleague or a student colleague of Jackie's, um, Kome Hosokawa, uh, did his PhD on the Yawaru language, um, completing it in 1991 at that mm. point, saying, the language has just a couple of aged speakers and is sort of on the way out. Mm. As of now, uh, the Yawaru have c uh, created a language centre and their goal is to have 20 fluent speakers by 2021 and they're well on target mm. to uh, complete that task. So those are just a couple of instances of supposedly extinct or near extinct languages that are going gangbusters. Um, Frankly, over the 20 years or so that I've been in language revival, what's happened has been beyond my wildest expectations. Mm. So I can talk at great length, but no, I'll probably get the hook. <laughs> so um, that's <laughs> it for me. That's right. It's pretty, it's pretty wild having to um, manage the man who actually trained me <laughs> and um, inspired me as a young scholar at Sydney University and also made me feel um, that... Um, our languages and our heritage are not something that <laughs> uh, was being taught to me um, in other courses I was doing, particularly anthropology, where it was all about us being sort of Stone Age primitive people and there was certainly no place in that dialogue for people like myself who was um, aiming to do a... I just thought, right, I'm going to be um, an academic. Um, I'm a very clever Aboriginal person. <laughs> I'm going to be an academic in this institution. But there wasn't really any place for that. So I think that another marvellous thing about all these dialogues about us and where we're heading with reviving our languages, we're doing this ourselves. Um, we certainly need the help of mechanics. Um, I am one of those mechanics too. I'm delighted that I did my PhD in linguistics. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And, uh, but I never regret doing it and I look forward to lots more Aboriginal people becoming leading academics in linguistics, not only in Australia but all around the world. So um, on that sweet note, let's go to one of the, the, great, the great linguistic mechanic families <laughs> of Australia and that would be the Grant family. Um, so Auntie Elaine, I just... Um, my hat's off to you forever for the work that your community and particularly your brother um, has done in um, reviving Wiradjuri, um, <laughs> sort of catching it before it went over the, the ledge um, into we got being to his quite, stage. quite <laughs> sleepy. <Yeah. laughs> so um, we have one of our national treasures here um, and between you and your, the rest of your family with uh, one of the great languages of New South Wales has inspired, mm. I think, a lot of the rest of us to get our languages going again. So what's that story? <laughs> well, I haven't got all day, but um, <laughs> before I start, I want to at least acknowledge, do an acknowledgement. Uh, you and Nadi Elaine Lomas, Galari Wiradjuri, Dira Madalina Walang Wiradjuri, Yinna Griffith Dig, my Nunurumbang is Griffith, my place of residence now is on Nunurumbang country here in Canberra. Nadi Winangana, Yinda Mara Nunurumbang. Mujiga, Balanda Dulumbul Wirumbira, Warumbira. Mara Ningana Yina today. I want to say thank you to the Nanamal people for allowing us to be on your land today, but we pay our respects and honour to you and for allowing us to speak my language on your country. Annie Agnes Shea gave us, for Ajri people, that um, great honour of being able to speak on, on the Nunawal lands. And we are forever grateful because um, I get to, to teach our Wiradjuri people uh, our Wiradjuri language on your country and we are forever grateful for that. Now, my story. I, I grew up in a little place, a big place called Griffith in New South Wales. But we also grew up, let me say this from the outset firstly, is that 
Wiradjuri language was not dead. Wiradjuri language was not lost. Wiradjuri language was a very, very much alive in our communities. But what was lost, though, was the ability for our Wiradjuri elders to pass down and to speak Wiradjuri in public. That was lost. What was lost also was the ability for our elders to, to uh, pass and teach Wiradjuri, practice culture, practice language. That was lost. That was in public. What was lost also was the ability for them to teach me as a young little Wiradjuri Buddha, Yinna, running around on Three Ways Bridge in Griffith, in, on Frog's Hollow, where Grandfather Johnson was <laughs> teaching us and, and, and learning, giving us that learning uh, in Wiradjuri. But he could only do that when he was safely in a place where, where he wasn't going to be ostracised or any reprisal happening. Um, my brother Stan tells me the story that when he was a young little Buddha running around uh, in the park in Griffith, um, the custom was that our, our old people, our elders used to work the fields in Griffith through the, uh, picking fruits and vegetables for the Italian families. And the, come Saturdays was the day they'd go and they'd cash their cheques and they'd do their shopping and the women would go do that and the men would stay in the park looking after the kids. So this particular day, grandfather saw Nanny coming across the, the, the road with all the women and their groceries. He called the kids, Danyana, 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 come, come, come here. And kids as kids do, <laughs> I'm just going to keep playing. And he says, Danyana. <laughs> and as he said that, an uh, off-duty police officer walks past and he heard him thinking that he was swearing to them kids mm. and he arrested him and put him in jail. I think he stayed in jail a couple of nights. That was grandfather forgetting his place and forgetting that he, was a, he, he could speak to his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren and forgetting that he was not allowed to do that in public. But... We are so grateful that over the years, my two brothers, Pastor Cecil Grant, who's, who's now passed away, and my brother Stan Grant Sr., and my sister Flo, Florence Grant, were, had that fire in their belly of wanting to do grandfather um, his honour and, and justice by getting that language out. And Stan and, and Cecil particularly wanted to learn and teach others and learn to say it properly, speak the language properly, not just, in other words, the slang bits. Grandfather was a traditional Wiradjuri man. He was initiated, he was a lawgiver, he was a clever man. And when he taught the young men, he taught them from his knowledge, from his power and his uh, handing down of his culture. So what he'd learnt, what Stan and Cecil had learnt, was true, pure Wiradjuri. And so he wanted to continue speaking that and, and he knew that there were suppressions. Now, our language was suppressed. It wasn't taken from us, it was suppressed. We weren't allowed to speak it. And, and these were the things that, that our people have had to um, walk around. The demeanour showed that they were down. You look at the, the eyes and you see the lights in their eyes have gone out because... They had lost their dulumbang, <coughs> excuse me, their dulumbang, their spirit, their gene, their heart wasn't in it anymore because their dulumbang was dead. It means their spirit wasn't there anymore. Until they all got together in, in, in private, when they gathered around the campfire, they'd have all their little musical instruments. Little old Mrs. Wyman would have her little squeeze box, that little hexagonal squeeze box. And the others would bring their little instruments, a, a big tea chest with a piece of string, a big piece of rope and stick to make their double bass, and they would sing language around the campfire. I grew up with that. I am 69. I remember very clearly the language that our people spoke. Now, I was brought up in a strong Christian family, and 
we went across every little Koori church in Wiradjuri country, down to Wattle Hill at Leeton, Sand Hills and Narandra, Narambi at Cowra, the Muri and the um, Willow Bend in Condo, the Dubbo and Gilgandra. We all went because we, we all wanted to have that fellowship but also to speak language privately, secretly. What, <coughs> excuse me, what the, the one that had the most impact on my life was in Condoblin, because that's where all, I believe, the language speakers were. There were these two beautiful old women, and when I see the language and I speak the language, their faces come before me. Auntie Emmy Melrose and Auntie, um, her sister, Auntie Sabina, they called her sub, Melrose. And Jack, Uncle Jack has um, Bassett, um, grandfather's brother, Uncle Johnny Johnson, Mulbon Johnson, all of these people spoke the Wiradjuri language. And when I, when I talk about Wiradjuri language, I think of this jar of honey. Take off the top. When you hear these two old women speak, you take off that jar and you pour and you watch the fluency of that honey pouring out, the thickness of that honey, <coughs> the richness of that honey, and you look at the bowl in which, which it's um, pouring into and it watch it consume that bowl. That's what language does to me. The reclaiming of the Wiradjuri language is something that just consumes me as a Wiradjuri yinna from Griffith. Nurambang Griffith. And the reason we have this is because my brother Stan Grant and Dr John Rudder and my brother Cecil Grant and the Wiradjuri Council of Elders who gave the imprimatur for this to be written. He went, Stan and John and Cecil and Flo did a lot of work. This is many years of work. They went to every corner of Wiradjuri country to get um, the words, to speak to elders who still spoke the language, to, to speak to ministers who had written down. Florence was, was the one who was given the 3,000 the 3, words um, of Dr. Uh, Reverend Gunther. He had 3,000 Wiradjuri words written down and he Somehow that got into the hands of my sister, who immediately, when she got them, looked at them, put them in the box and went off overseas for a year or two. <laughs> As you do, Jackie. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so in the meantime, my two brothers are there, like, trying to uh, remember grandfather's words and remember those other words that were written down. So they, they made this little writ, uh, list. Then when Flo come back, she just casually handed this... 3,000 word Gunther list to my brother Cecil who almost said, how long have you had this? <laughs> <laughs> Where's this been? You know, and Florence like, oh, I'll put it in my box and then I went overseas. And then, oh, you know, so they could have been further advanced but that doesn't really matter because the rest is history. Now today, um, Cecil and Flo sat down with, well, recently um, we started to work with Charles Sturt University and Cecil and Flo sat down with Ross Chambers, who was then the Vice-Chancellor, and talked with them about the possibility of this language, this gift that we've been given, to use this gift to teach others, other Wiradjuri people, about speaking language. And Ross Chambers had obviously been so um, affected by it that he then went to his mob, his people at the university and spoke about the starting of this Wiradjuri language cultural and heritage program and nation building. Um, the, the current vice chancellor, um, Professor and Andy Van, who has been there since the first language class had happened, he sent me a note to say that um, he said, I feel deeply privileged as vice chancellor to have been at the head of the university at the time when the delivery of the program was initiated. <coughs> Excuse me. This program has enormous impact in community and seeing the sense of pride that it has grown, helped to grow amongst Wiradjuri people has been one of his career highlights. Now, coming from a vice chancellor who's got a huge university and for him to focus on the work of a few Wiradjuri people who thought it would be fantastic to have this at university level. And I think at this point, might, might, I might be wrong, but we were the only university 
to have a Rajwa language or Rajwa or any language taught um, at that stage. One of the other quick things, Jackie, is is that since this course has started, we've had 138 graduates, and and I'm proudly one of them. I, I graduated with 13 others of my colleagues um, in December last year. So I now feel pride <laughs> that this language is in my hands and for me to deliver to my community and freely. And I'm doing that and I have two of my beautiful students here. I'm, I'm teaching Wiradjuri to the Gilbert family. There's seven of them this time and there's another seven in the win wings waiting and more after that because their grandmother had so much wanted before she had departed this earth, she wanted her grandchildren to learn this language. And we're doing that. This is our third week this afternoon. It'll be our third week. And it is such a, 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 an honour for me to be able to give my people their language back. And not just giving it back, but I know that this has enhanced their lives and what it will do will change communities. Um, Am I able to talk about our vision now? Of course. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> no, 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 please stop. <laughs> <Okay>. All right. <laughs> now, 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 my vision for Wiradjuri language is that we at Charles Sturt University, and let me say hi to... They haven't, would you believe this, they're having a streaming party at Charles Sturt University today? Oh. Say hello to, to my fellow uh, colleagues and, and my lecturers there who are gladly sitting around probably having raisin toast and coffee while I'm here sweating <laughs> it out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at Charles Sturt we have this fantastic team. Lloyd Dolan, we call him the walking, the walking um, you know, he has the knowledge, he, he knows all about history. He's that walking encyclopedia that you go to to ask. So Captain Cook, um, you said he wasn't a captain? No, he was a lieutenant. He wasn't a captain. He was just the captain because that's what his sailors called him, aye, aye, captain, and everybody then took up that mantle, Captain Cook. And I know you've got a thing here, but I'm not going to go in into that today. <laughs> I think <laughs> we'll stay away. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, we've got this beautiful young woman who fluently... <coughs> Excuse me. Who fluently Drink water. can teach the language just like these two old Aboriginal women of my, my youth. Letitia Harris has got that ability to be able to go to you and pass on to you the language of our people. 50,000 years strong, walking in our ancestors' footsteps. What a privilege for me to sit under her tutelage. She has that ability to be the next Emmy Melrose, the next Sab Melrose, the next... Whereas we, um, we talk about people being um, can put up there as being the top leaders in this country in speaking our language. And then, of course, we have young Debbie Evans, who's actually a Barkindji woman in Wiradjuri clothing. She actually lives in Wiradjuri country and works very much for our Wiradjuri people in the, at the university with the language. And Debbie's been responsible for getting students through encouraging them to come through the course and, and encouraging while they're there. Then young, uh, another fellow called Larry, um, Yari, Yari, his name's Harry, but we call him Yari, Yari Lambshead. He's one of the quiet achievers. He's the one that walks around and assesses each student while, while the teaching's happening. And if he sees someone struggling, he sneaks in beside you and whispers in your ear what explaining what Letitia's saying or explaining what Lloyd's saying. And the one that underpins all of that is Professor Sue Green Townsend. She pulls them together and she supports them. She's actually the conduit between the, the staff, the um, Vice-Chancellery and the students and the community. She, she involves, they all involve the elders so much that the elders feel such a strong part of this language program, reclaiming through the Wiradjuri Council of Elders, but also through their own community um, commitments. My vision. Okay, here comes I have a dream speech. <laughs> I have a dream 
I have a dream that every man, woman, child, and I'll even say dog, because my little dog, Lucy, understood Baradzri. <laughs> of course. She understood Baradzri. I'd say, Dangan. She'd come for food. I'd say, we're in ya, come for bed, sleep. <laughs> and I'd say, wait, stop. You know, like that, stop. <laughs> Shh, quiet. Dilma. <laughs> so Lucy understood it, and I'm sure that if every little puppy dog in Marajri country, and she's a Marajri dog, she was born in Marajri country. So if, if we could, my dream is that every man, woman, child and beast learns Wiradjuri country in this lifetime. Learns Wiradjuri in their country, on their country, in their home, on their space. We want to get a little yellow bus, yours truly driving, <laughs> taking that across Wiradjuri to where the people are and not getting them to come to where Charles Sturt University is. Teaching Wiradjuri on their country, in their country, for their country. And understanding that people have families, but also this is a great opportunity to actually go and give, pass that fire stick, that language stick along throughout, have that burning brightly along Wiradjuri country so that people don't have to leave their nests, their homes, their country, to learn to speak and to learn and, and take back what was um, suppressed from them years ago. My understanding for, for, for the Charles Sturt University is also they want to have their own language centre. This is the dream of all of us, is that we, in Wiradjuri country we have our own language centre that we can say our centre of excellence is here. Mm. Wiradjuri language is not dead, Wiradjuri la language is not lost. Wiradjuri language is, is no longer suppressed. Suppressing order gone. We are now alive and well and living in Wiradjuri country. Uh, Mandangu, thank you. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I have a dream that your dream is realised. And I look forward to the day when all of us are multilingual again and speaking each other's languages. And of course, the wonderful thing is that if you learn one Australian language, um, then it becomes easy to learn more of them. Jackie, um, there's just one more point I forgot. If I can just say this. <laughs> Please do. My, my third or fourth dream, which could <laughs> become the top, is that... You know how we fill out the census forms and it says language speak, spoken at home? I want to see Wiradjuri written on all of those forms in Wiradjuri country. I want to see Wiradjuri language being uh, called one number one speaking language instead of English as our first language. Mm. Wiradjuri is our first language. Obviously, we still have to speak English. That's okay. Because in order for us to get things done and to work together, we need, in the spirit of reconciliation, we need to have that the bilingual. But I also agree with you that um, my grandfather spoke seven different languages because mm. they had common grounds and they used to come and they used to mm. speak to each other to cross, to get that welcome to country to cross their lands. And, and grandfather spoke seven different ling languages. And we don't use the word lingo, that is a no-no because lingo is slang. Language is what we use because that is the pure way of saying who we are. Wiradjuri Niang, Wiradjuri people. Wiradjuri, uh, when they say Wiray Wiradjuri, uh, Niang means no language, and we say Wiray, uh, main, no people. But we now have this wonderful resource. There's a new book out now, by the way. It's the Wiradjuri language, it's called the New Wiradjuri Language Book. So there you go, everyone. Go out and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're going to, um, as we do in Australia, often gaze longingly across the ditch uh, <laughs> where um, mm -hmm. we, we have in our presence today fabulous um, the Commissioner for Maori Language. When are we going to have this in Australia? You know, happily volunteer. No, no, the first female commissioner, how fabulous. Um, Maori, yes. Maori <laughs> uh, is, of course not just um, one language, um, it's many language, there are many Māori languages in New Zealand. Um, it's a wicked trick, isn't it, to, to, I mean, 
really get this language um, going in the way that Māori is now. Um, legislation has helped and you've had a hell of a lot to do with that. Um, and also to do with Māori universities where Māori is the medium for ed instruction and people can do their PhDs in Māori. Um, I look forward to the day in Australia where you can pick out of our 407 and rising in number of languages and do a PhD in one or more of our languages. So please, Ravinia, can you tell us what's the wicked trick? Kia ora koutou katoa, e te whakaminenga. Uh, ko tātou mai nei i tēnei ahiahi uh, ka nui aku mihi ki a koutou. Uh, ki a Tyrone, rau ko tāna tō maiti i hō mai uh, hei taonga mō tātou katoa tō rātou reo, tō rāua reo, uh, te reo o tēnei whenua. Uh, ka mihi ki a koe e koe, ko rua um, tahi um, aku hoa i tēnei ata. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, and also acknowledge um, this land and the peoples in my own language. As I was sitting yesterday thinking about, oh, what can I talk about? Because mm. a bit like Michael and our auntie over here, mm. how long is a piece of string, really, <laughs> when it comes to this? Because it's a long game, right? So I was thinking about different kinds of things that connect us and thinking about Ray's call, um, conversation yesterday around connection and relationships being very key to um, building trust, but also that ability to think about language revitalization. So if I thought about um, what connects us, you know, um, in our worldview, I think about Maui, and Maui is um, uh, a tipua, or as uh, ethnographers like to call a demigod, but Maui was a mischief. Maui liked to explore and did great adventures and on the South Island, which was his canoe, he fished up the North Island, which is why it kind of looks like a fish. And so in our language, it's a fish. Uh, I come from the head of the fish in Wellington. Um, and so Maui is also found throughout Polynesia uh, as a god, as a demigod and all sorts, not just on the Moana film, um, it's a Dwayne Johnson rendition of it. <laughs> but also Australia for us, we consider it Te Papaka Nui a Maui, which means the giant crab of Maui. So next to the fish is this big crab, and if you think around the Northern Territory being part of the pincers and things like that. So in our worldview, Maui is a great connector, but Maui's also a champion. He goes out and he tries and defeats everything, including uh, immortality. That's the only place he fails. But I kind of see us as language champions like Maui. We have to take some risks. We have to push against the tide in order to ensure that our languages are living languages. If I think about the preserving um, the indigenous languages of the Pacific, I see institutions like this as being uh, significant um, places for helping us do that. So if that was the objective, in New Zealand, I would say that we have preserved our language. As Paul said yesterday, we have the largest corpus of Māori language materials in our libraries, um, but we just don't use them. So for me, I kind of think of the analogy of a pickle. So if you pickle something, it's, you pickle it so it can last a long time, and you preserve it. And if I think about the ingredients, basic ingredients of the pickle, and thinking about language revitalization, you know, the tears that represent, is represented in the salt. Uh, the water, which of course comes from our lands and gives life to us as peoples. The pepper and the herbs locally uh, come from our earth. Um, the sugar is from that passion by not only our own people, but also curators and ethnographers long ago to kind of put that together. And the vinegar is kind of like that new kind of technology that brings them together and kind of makes this pickling agent. Mm -hmm. So one of the things for me, so we have a, in New Zealand we describe libraries as pataka kai, or our food storehouses. So we've got all these pickles in there, in many ways. But like pickles, uh, they're kind of condiments. They kind of, you know, enhance your meal. They're not the meal itself. Mm -hmm. So how do you change our language from being the relish to being relished? by our people mm. in the main part of our dietary requirements. So mm. nobody wants to always eat vinegar. I personally love vinegar. So <laughs> I could probably sit there and just eat a whole jar of pickles, but I'm not everybody. 
One of the other things that people have talked about around reconciliation um, and the stories here uh, are clearly different from at home and I can see why Jackie uh, makes mention of staring across at us and kind of thinking, yeah, <laughs> part of it is our Maui kind of spirit, just like, yeah, we're ready to just always go, yeah, give it a go, try another way around. Um, and for us, the legislation in 1987 is a result of our Treaty of Waitangi claim um, for the language. So in 1985, the tribunal heard the claim that under Article 2 of the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, the language is a taonga, or uh, a treasure. Now, um, a lot of the impetus behind the claim and the initiatives were by the people. They were not by the state, they were by the people mobilising themselves and creating movements. So the Language Nest movement, is a, it started as a movement. The Cuisinier Rod, Te Atarangi, um, adult teaching program was a movement. It started in our communities, started at the Flax Roots, uh, and they gained momentum. So they mushroomed quite quickly across the country. And as a result, the government came in and decided that they should regulate it a little bit, which I think they find is, let's add some policy and some funding and dangle this kind of approach to you that, um, that we start to control the movement. So the movement moves from a movement of the people to an institution. And the legislation uh, in 1987 is essentially you get Te Reo Māori becomes an official language, the first legal official language in New Zealand. Uh, you create the creation of the Māori Language, uh, Māori Language Commission and the commission can give out licences for interpretation. Um, and you can also speak some Māori language in the court. That was about it. So for the first few years of the commission, uh, much like Cook and Banks and Parkinson, we did lots of wordless, lots and lots and lots of wordless. The commission focused on that. Uh, but the commission had no teeth, so if somebody wasn't speaking the language or they weren't uh, abiding by the legislation, the commission really had no grounds to be able to say, actually, that's wrong. We could say it, but that didn't give you any actual teeth. So it was like a toothless beast. Mm. 30 years later, um, uh, and some very up and down movements in uh, New Zealand with respect to the language, because we get immersion schools, we get universities, we get tertiary providers. Um, but what we found is the policy makers were marginalising those who've had a focus on language and decided to put a value judgement on them that was lesser than uh, the mainstream. So for example, a kohanga reo or a language nest teacher uh, their salary is half that of a early childhood provider. Mm. And so more recently the Kohanga Reo Movement Trust took um, their claim to the Waitangi Tribunal for marginalisation in their policies. Now according to the Ministry of Education, they had decided, they had put a value judgement on the qualifications that the Kohanga Reo had produced versus what mm. other tertiary providers do and therefore weighting it means you get less resourcing. So absolute, obvious uh, marginalisation of our people. And this is right across the board. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, so one of my research areas is language planning and policy. I love it, it's, like, it's my jam. <laughs> I talk about it all day, actually. <laughs> but had the opportunity and the privilege to chair an independent advisory group on the legislation. We had a change uh, in the previous government, the Māori Party were keen to give some more teeth to the legislation, <coughs> um, and they were a little bit nervous, so they got people like myself to review it. We reviewed it, we went around the country and talked to our people, and the clear messaging we got was give our people the ability to become the movement again and focus on our family. So we use the analogy of our traditional meeting house, which has got a very defined apex um, on the outside, but it's got a very unique kind of um, architecture. That on the left-hand side, when you're facing the house, it's the tiny side. 
and it's called the tiny side. And that's where the um, local people sleep. And on the other side of the house, opposite, is the large side of the house. And that's for the visitors, where you give them more. It's physically in that way. So we use the house's analogy of micro and macro language planning. So we uh, recommended that a new entity be established, which represented tribes and uh, language initiatives that look after the micro side of the house. And their focus is on kia ukai pō anō te reo, which means return the language to the breast of the mother, so it becomes their mother tongue again. Mm -hmm. So that's their vision. On the other side of the house, on the macro side, is all the government agencies. And then the government agencies are expected to make up the other side of the house and the posts on the house. And that idea of being able to <coughs> face each other and have the hard conversations around language revitalisation. And what is the role of the Crown? How does the state support and create conditions that allow our families to feel flourish mm. in society with the language? So it's the clear demarcation. The Māori Language Commission now is in charge of coordinating the Crown strategy. The Crown strategy is called Kia mā hora hora te reo, let the language be heard everywhere. Um, and using that macro approach around broadcasting and education, ensuring that the language is visible, audible, um, and actively used. So the focus for us is no more about pickle. The focus now is around living language and how do we get the next generation to uh, use. So I was looking at Jai today and, uh, and he reminds me of the generations that we have at home who started in Kohanga Reo. Mm. So they are our new first language speakers. Mm -hmm. So we had lots of second language speakers. I'm the first commissioner to be a second language speaker. All my predecessors, all seven of them, were elderly statesmen who were all native language speakers. Mm -hmm. And part of the struggle for them is they don't understand what loss means. Mm -hmm. So when you don't know, n when you don't know your own, when you don't know what it's like to not have your language, it's really a hard conceptually for them to see that until they see their children and their grandchildren. So I looked at Jai today and I was like, got another Maui in the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because language revitalization is a very long game, right? That's why we pickle, because it takes a long time. <laughs> you know, it takes one generation to lose the language and three generations to restore. So this is not a fast game. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so how do we reconceptualize supporting our families and our Moombas and our elders to continue to feed language to the next generation? And how do we as big institutions, like libraries, like universities, uh, like all the mechanics that support, how do we provide conditions that enables our people to be able to use the language anywhere right across our countries? Mm. Kia ora. <coughs> relishing that. <laughs> so, um, yes, look, I think um, where Australia really lags is in this, uh, in, the, in the, the reality that we just don't have language policy for any languages. Um, there have been attempts, there have been wonderful attempts, um, but now in New South Wales there is legislation um, to protect New South Wales languages. That's the beginning. So when I say there isn't any, there, there is the beginning of it. And once again, um, there's been quite a big Wiradjuri input to that. And also the Dangari, so all these people who are meant to be non-existent. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful thing to see that Australia is beginning to embrace the idea that um, we can actually uh, coordinate some kind of effort here in this country in the way that you have in New Zealand. And it's clearly, it's, it is still a long game. Um, we have our great warriors like and heroes like Maui. Um, they're all over our country, and as you say, young Jai is one of them. I'd like to think that my Lara, who was here yesterday, oh, yeah. will be another one. And have um, one over here. We have yeah. this, more of them over here. We've got them all over this room, and, and the mothers and fathers of them. So um, I think it's great, and it's nice to think that we can, from New Zealand, you can chuck a hand back and give us inspiration. Our Native Title Act 
indeed was inspired in many ways by the legislation in New Zealand um, that came out of a recognition of your sovereign rights. So I live for the day when we are recognised as the sovereign peoples of this country, but I may not live through that recognition. But so look, thank you to the three panellists. We have got a, a little bit of time. <laughs> Um, uh, just a few questions. Well, Jackie, um, before you start, I, yeah. I should have said something at the beginning. Mm. Um, it was remiss of me to uh, not give you the apologies of my brother, Stan Grant Senior, who, who um, should be here today, but he's unwell, so he's asked little sister, who says who <laughs> can't say no, <laughs> to come and sit in for him. So he sends his deepest apologies and also um, his gratefulness that we're all interested mm. in, in reclaiming and what happens with our languages. Mm. Oh, he's certainly Thank present you. here. So Sorry? He's certainly present oh, here. Oh, most definitely. So he's probably watching. I'm sure he is. <laughs> so <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so, okay, so questions, comments? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I should say wait for the mic, please. Sorry. Um, at the moment, as I understand it, um, there's... I think it's Australia-wide, but it's definitely in the ACT. Students have to learn from year three, so they're about nine, ten years old, up through high school, they have to have a second language. Mm -hmm. And now uh, our school is doing French, which is lovely, but <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this is a way of sneaking it in, like, because language teachers of any language are really hard to come by. It's quite a good salary, unlike this, this that terrible thing in New Zealand where is a disparity in the... So, I don't know whether that's worth giving it a go, Ch training t teachers with the language and then popping them in schools and going under the radar, maybe. Look, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. One of the things I'd say is that um, we've had um, no university in Australia yet take up a full degree course in Australian languages. How bizarre. I tried at Sydney University. Uh, Michael and I designed the Australian Curriculum for Languages Framework for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Languages. Um, I said, oh, look, you know, easy, let's have a, a degree course in Australian languages. So well, we have a start. Charles Sturt Yes, University. Charles Sturt has definitely started. And, um, but the problem is we just don't have, you can't go and do it like you would with French. Be Bachelor of Arts French, um, teacher training, become a teacher. We've got the teacher training. And in fact, we've got some wonderful Indigenous Australian teachers, but we just don't have that kind of taking on board in the way that in New Zealand you have. You can, could you imagine in New Zealand not being able to do a degree in Māori mm. anything? Mm. Mm. Um, so this is something this country needs to take on board. So I think that's a very good point. Um, mm. Further comments? Or um, in New South Wales, uh, Wiradjuri language was um, first taught in, in parks and forbes. Um, as part of their, their school curriculum. Um, th and then there are other schools throughout New South Wales that are taking that on board as well. So um, and I think New South Wales is pretty well um, moving toward wanting to um, put that across, uh, the curriculum across mm -hmm. the state as, as a key way of, of teaching language and making language uh, strongly uh, supporting language in, in the schools, teaching children from on the way up. Um, I, I've, I've actually gone through a few schools myself and, and sang in language, because that's the way you learn, by singing the language. Once you sing it, you can learn how to say it. If you look at the word, if I picked out a word in this dictionary and I showed you and said to you, how do you say that, you'd probably choke. <laughs> but if I tell you how to sing it, you would sing it, no problems. Gugabara will be on the mud and Kookaburra sitting in the old gum tree. Now you all know that. So if I was to teach you to sing that, you'd be saying, oh, you'd be having connections, I know, because I've seen it happen. But once you sing the language, and that's how, how we taught maths. We were taught to sing. One and one or two, two, you know, who taught? And the teaching Wiradjuri language in schools is a key way of teaching and learning because there you teach the children, but teach the family. They Can go I home and can I just say that you need to put pressure on the universities and um, governments also to get this happening because yep. what was put to me at Sydney University was could you prove that there would be students interested oh in yeah. learning an Aboriginal language or a Tell Child Strait Islander? So it's ridiculous, mm. that's right. Mm. There's another question up here. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you very much, Jacqueline, and the panel for that rich discussion. Um, just a question to Michael. Um, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the revitalisation or the work going on with Tasmanian Aboriginal languages. Mm. We have, you know, the beautiful um, Fanny Cochran wax cylinder recordings. Is there anything you could share on that with us? Actually, it may be that Jackie can <laughs> handle this better because you've been to Tasmania and talked with the uh, language centre there. Um, it's been slow progress and for some time uh, the Palawa were uh, diffident about engaging with the school sector which is not so good if you want to uh, have a school based approach but Janky you've got other things to say as well I think. Oh, I, I think that's the key point yep. is that the language Palawa Karani or Palawa Gani um, is cranking along in mm -hmm. the community, but um, there is some um, concern in the Palawa <coughs> community that um, that the language will be stolen from them. I mean, that that's if anywhere in Australia has suffered, the Aboriginal people of Tasmania have really had it hard. Having said that, I've just been doing some work with the people in the Sydney area um, with a language that's now called, um, as you heard from Ray, Yesterday, you know, depending on where you are in Sydney, there are, um, are different um, names for the language, but um, people are now able to teach their language in the way that Nunnamal is too. And they are people who were the first point of invasion and are um, actually drawing strength from being able to share their language with the wider community in the way that um, Auntie Elaine's talking about with Wiradjuri as well. Um, but the Palawar, I think there's a bit of a journey there to. I think recover from the atrocities committed on those people, really. So um, I think we we actually have to do morning tea. Tragically, um, I'd like to thank all our um, speakers, and it's been a privilege to sit on this panel with you. And um, I'm sure that everybody can approach our panel here and ask them questions in. Um, the break time. Thank you very much for keeping us to time. <laughs> I, I really don't like cutting this panel I, off. I feel like I'm retiring. You are retiring. Right. <laughs> uh, but ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for our panel. Uh, <laughs>